Welcome to the 2020 AUCD for All Celebrating Leadership in Arts and Culture. My name is Sachin Pavithran. I'm the president of the AUCD board. I'm also the director of policy at the Utah USED. It's my honor to be a part of this wonderful network and I am glad to see that many of you are participating in this virtual platform to celebrate the work that we do in this network. I want to recognize all the sponsors that has continued to support us in spite of this current situation. And I also want to recognize our network for all the work that they are doing to address the need that has come up during this unprecedented times. I do want to recognize the hard work put in by the wonderful staff at the AUCD who has taken, taken it on to pr bring this gala into the virtual platform and the other work that they are doing to help our large network in this unprecedented times. This gala over the years has brought a lot of partners together and we hope that the same continues with this gala and the future galas that we're gonna have. Thank you and appreciate all the support. And welcome to our virtual gala attendees this evening and for your strong leadership on the AUCD Board of Directors. And I'd like to extend my personal thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us this evening for the AUCD 2020 Gala, Leadership in Arts and Culture, to celebrate our honorees and their work, as well as the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'd also like to take this moment to recognize the phenomenal work of the AUCD staff to transform this gala into a virtual experience for everyone and ensure we preserved this opportunity to recognize our honorees, supporters, and network. The planning of the AUCD gala is supported by a committee of dedicated disability advocates and professionals who work tirelessly year round with and for people with disabilities and their families. Their continued support of this event is greatly appreciated. A full list of our gala committee members can be found at aucdforall.org. That's www.aucd, the number four, all.org. We're also deeply grateful for the commitment of our gala sponsors who are also listed on the website. Our lead sponsors continue to be J.P. Morgan Chase, Anthem, and Centene, as well as significant support this year from Walmart. To all of our sponsors, those returning year after year and new, we thank you for helping us to exceed our fundraising goal. The revenue we receive from this event helps AUCD sustain our capacity in the areas of policy advocacy and communication. And the relationships built around the gala often translate to partnerships that expand the scope and reach of our network in every state and territory. This year, AUCD is celebrating leadership in arts and culture. And although we aren't in person with our honorees tonight, we are delighted to recognize the extraordinary work of Reva Lehrer and kinetic light. Both have not just explored what inclusion means in the arts and culture, but have pushed boundaries and challenged societal norms in these areas. We're also excited to hear from Joe Shapiro of National Public Radio, who's joining us to talk about the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the importance of civil rights and equal opportunity for people with disabilities and their families. We thank all of our speakers for providing videos for this virtual event so that we can share their voices with you. In keeping with this year's theme, we ask many centers and programs from our network and beyond for stories about inclusion in and access to arts and culture. Those stories reflecting local, state, and national efforts are listed on our GALA website. What you will find is a rich tapestry of innovative programs and partnerships that create and advance access to arts and culture for children and adults with disabilities 
across the U.S. and territories. These programs are designed for and with people with disabilities. There is an expectation and an assumption that they will be inclusive and welcoming. These programs create opportunity and equal opportunity regardless of ability. This is the promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we also celebrate tonight. 30 years ago, when Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, they established four goals for our community. Equality of opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency, and full participation. Tremendous progress has been made in each of those areas. But progress under the ADA only happens when people understand what the law requires and then choose to make it a priority to ensure that individuals with disabilities are included in all aspects of community life. As Senator Tom Harkin, the chief sponsor of the ADA, said on the 20th anniversary of the act, it's one thing for people with disabilities to have rights on paper and a very different thing to know that they enjoy those rights in everyday practice, especially in their communities and in the workplace. We are in an ongoing fight, a never ending struggle to vindicate those rights. We know that while much progress has been made, there is much work to do. Every part of the AUCD network works tirelessly every day to advance the spirit of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Whether engaging in cutting edge research or providing training programs to prepare the clinical leaders of tomorrow to better understand the disability experience, to serve people and families better. We partner with people with disabilities in everything we do. So thank you again for joining us tonight and let's celebrate those we are gathered here to honor. Next, we'll hear from AUCD board member, J.D. Flores, who will introduce our honorees and speakers this evening. Take it away, J.D. Good evening, everyone. I am so pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you to AUCD's 2020 virtual gala, as well as introduce our amazing honorees and speakers. I am J.D. Flores. I come Hailing to you from the Winter Wonderland that is Rochester, New York. I am the COLA co-chair this year, as well as an AUCD board member. And I have the pleasure of working at the University of Rochester's USED and LEND program. Senator Tammy Duckworth. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all staying healthy and doing as well as possible during these scary times. I know this isn't how we plan to celebrate, but I wanted to be sure to congratulate Illinois' own Riva Lehrer on her amazing achievement and to thank all of you for working so hard to create a world where everyone has the opportunity to lead full independent lives. Today is a celebration of the strength of this community. Today, we get to take pride in how far we've come before we get back to fighting for our rights tomorrow. 30 years ago, a thousand activists gathered in DC to demand that Congress give Americans with disabilities the basic rights that our constitution promised. Dozens of them got out of their wheelchairs and one inch at a time crawled up the 83 steps of the Capitol building. It's thanks to them and that the log jam in Congress was broken and the ADA was finally enshrined into law, helping us lead the full lives that we deserve. We've come a long way since that day in 1990, but we all know how far we still have to go. It's 2020. We shouldn't have to keep pouring that much energy just into defending our most basic rights. We shouldn't still be fending off legislation that would gut the ADA. We shouldn't still face a reality where some Americans can't get work or get to work, can't go to school or to the grocery store on the corner a reality where some employers still refuse to pay people with disabilities a living wage. So it's time for this community to do what it does best, speak out, raise our voices, even if right now we have to do so from our homes rather than the steps of the Capitol, demanding better for ourselves and for this country. That's exactly what Riva has done time and time again, with every portrait she paints, with every word she writes. Riva, thank you for using your individual talent for the common good, 
for pushing forward conversations about embodiment and disability, for refusing to accept a status quo that doesn't accept all of us, and for being an inspiration for so many. Congratulations again. I'm so grateful to call you and everyone in the AUCD community, my partners in this fight. Please enjoy select artwork by Riva Lair. Sixty six degrees, twenty nineteen, acrylic on paper, twelve inches by ten inches. A self portrait, Riva's arms are widespread and back is bare, her gold sequin dress slipping into the water in which she is wading. She turns her head over her left shoulder, flexing her back muscles and causing her skin to fold over her ribs. Streams of water fall on her, creating bright rings in the water as they drip, matching the dress and overgrowth of grass in the bank in front of her. Next portrait. Susan Nussbaum, 1998, acrylic on panel, 16 inches by 26 inches. Susan Nussbaum is a writer, actress, director, and disability rights activist who has starred in, written, and or directed productions at the Goodman, Victory Gardens, Blue Rider, and other major venues. Her first novel, Good Kings, Bad Kings, won the Bellwether Prize in 2013. Nussbaum's plays and essays have been featured in numerous anthologies, including No Beyond Victims and Villains, Contemporary Plays by Disabled Playwrights. Nussbaum lives in Chicago, Illinois. A curly-haired white woman with a multicolored shawl draped over one shoulder leans forward in her wheelchair. One arm is over the back of her chair and the other crossed over her lap. She sits on a balcony that has a view of the sea. Red curtains frame the portrait as if Susan is on a stage. A metal pole dissects the portrait next to Susan. Objects fly in the air as if blown by the wind. A pencil, a compact case, a star, a burning wheel, a red high-heeled shoe. Next portrait. Techie Lomniki, 1999, acrylic on panel, 48 inches by 36 inches. Techie Lomniki, writer, actress, director, and filmmaker, is the co-founder and director of Tell and Tales Theater and the Six Stories Up Performance School. A smiling white woman with dwarfism wearing a ruffled slip dress and Mary Jane styled shoes stands up using a crutch under one arm. Her other crutch is on the wooden floor, also covered in clothes and costumes. The door in the background is slightly open and rosary beads dangle on the frame. Next portrait. Tim slash owl, 2011, Charcoal, glass, clay, papers, Bible pages, wire, twigs, and collage on Shula's Hammer board, 40 inches by 30 inches by 3 inches. Chicago artist Tim Lally is well known for a work depicting his daughter, Tema, who is profoundly disabled. Tema suffered a cardiac arrest just after birth. As a result, she is blind, paralyzed, and nonverbal. Much of Tim's work has been an exploration of what it's like to be her. My portraiture practice is based on informed consent. I was unable to ask Tema for her consent due to her impairment, so I chose instead to depict the father and daughter relationship. The owl costume on Tim's lap is an avatar for Tema. Owl wisdom is complex. Its message is cryptic and obscure. The owl asks who, demanding that the seeker explain himself. Tim's conviction is that one does not need to earn love to be loved. A human does not need to be perfect or prove their worth. They are deserving of love by simply being. The owl offers Tim a fragmented mask and fragile wings in order to fully immerse himself in Tema's endless moment. 
Next portrait. The Risk Pictures, Alice Shepard by Riva Lair and Alice Shepard, 2016. Two layers of mylar acetate with mixed media and collage, 40 inches by 50 inches. Alice Shepard has taken the dance world by storm through her own troupe, Kinetic Light. In addition, she has danced with various projects in the United Kingdom and United States. Risk activity. Alice Shepard added cartoons, feet, hands, and the small collage figure in abdomen. A nude, multiracial black woman with gray and bright highlights in her curly hair is on her back, as if balancing on the wheel of her wheelchair, which is turned on its side. Alice holds the toes of her right foot and points her opposite hand towards the stage. Two blue stage curtains tied with rope frame the portrait. Next portrait. Liz Carr, 2011, acrylic on panel, 24 inches by 12 inches. Liz Carr has had an enormous impact on the representation of disabled people in the UK. She first became famous as the co-host of Ouch on BBC Radio, along with Matt Fraser. This led to an eight year stint as forensic scientist Clarissa on the BBC's Silent Witness. She has performed for years in the UK, EU, and US as a comedian, including at the Edinburgh Fringe Fest, and on stage as the star of her play, Assisted Suicide, the Musical, in London. Wrapped in multicolored Christmas lights, is painted facing the audience head on. She interlaces her fingers and has shadows over her soft expression. Liz is wearing jeans. At the base of her pants, the lights wrapping around Liz entangle with barbed wire. Next portrait. Alison Bechtel, 2010, charcoal and mixed media dimensional collage on paper, 30 inches by 44 inches by one inch, collection of the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian. Alison Bechtel was first known as the author of a comic strip titled Dykes to Watch Out For. Bechtel walked away from that strip in order to write her memoir, Fun Home, which became the basis for the Tony Award-winning musical of the same name and its sequel, Are You My Mother? Our collaboration was documented by filmmaker Carissa King O'Brien in the short, The Paper Mirror. Alison crouches in the corner of a room holding up a mirror as if to see the cartoon woman painted on the wall behind her in blue ink, the only color used in the black, white, and sepia-toned portrait. Her body casts a shadow behind the cartoon woman, her other arm extended behind her holding a long paintbrush. Next portrait. Eli Clare, 1997. Acrylic on panel, 18 inches by 24 inches. Eli Clare, poet, Eli Clare, poet and essayist, is one of the most influential artists and theorists working in disability culture. His many books include Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure, 2017, and Exile and Pride, Disability, Queerness, and Liberation, 1999. Claire is based in Burlington, Vermont. A man with short red hair and wire-framed glasses kneels on the bank of a river under a tree. He is using both arms to clutch branches with bright red leaves, tucking some into his button-up shirt. He is also wearing jean shorts and hiking boots with a plaid shirt on the ground in front of him. First, I want to extend my deepest thanks to the AUCD for the honor of this award. It has proved to be an incredible bright spot in what is obviously a difficult year. But in addition, I am thrilled that AUCD has chosen this year to honor disability arts and culture, though they could never have known how terribly perfect their choice would be. We are all arguing for our lives now. Disability culture has never been more urgently needed. 
I didn't always feel like this. 28 years ago, I believed that being disabled was the great tragedy of my life. And I did all I could to avoid people like me. So it was with great reluctance that I let a friend drag me to a performance by Susan Nussbaum. My friend said that the playwright was disabled. So no doubt I would find it deeply meaningful. Right. But Susan's play, Meshuggah Mismo, wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. For the first time, I saw the hilarity and the originality and the beauty of disability. When I left the theater that night, I was on my way to being a very different person. After that, I became friends with Susan, and she introduced me to a community of disabled performers, artists, writers, and academics who were, as it turned out, among the foundational members of disability culture. I was incredibly lucky, and I saw that their work was a total redefinition of who we were. We weren't victims or tragedies, but we were creative innovators who rethought what it meant to be embodied. And I was entranced. I asked them to sit for portraits, and with each collaboration, I learned more about the complicated beauty of impairment. They changed who I was and how I understood my life. But it's here now in 2020, and everything feels so fragile all over again. I noticed that when the news hit, my able-bodied friends were most apt to post political arguments and medical references. My crip friends went straight to the practicalities. What did we need in our homes? Where could we find critical supplies? And most importantly, how could we band together to help ourselves? I turn on the news, and there are all our words, interdependence, interconnectedness, and right to care. Her values are suddenly mainstream values as people get a taste of what it feels like to argue for your right to breathe. And disabled people are so necessary now. We are the ones who know how to let go of old paradigms, to find new pathways on an alien map, and that's why I'm so glad that AUCD chose this year to highlight art. Art slips under our defenses, makes bridges between thought and feeling, slides between the locked gates of politics and belief. Art might not change the world, but it does change one person at a time. And yes, we need more than art now, certainly. We need science and we need politics. But art makes us visible, audible, touchable. Alice and Kinetic Light, me, my portrait collaborators, we say we live with the truth of human fragility. We make art on the cliff edge. We go on and we breathe. Thank you. Hey, everyone. It's your fave JD again. I am now pleased to present the Leadership for All Award to Honoree Kinetic Light, a dance group led by disabled artists that creates, performs, and teaches at the intersections of access to the arts, disability, dance, and race. Kinetic Light was founded in 2016 by Alex Shepard and two other disabled artists, Laurel Lawson and Michael Mack. Together, they use dance and technology to explore the rich history of disabled artists and highlight the importance of access to the arts for people with disabilities and people of color. They perform across the country and internationally and have received numerous of high profile grants and awards. Their most recent pieces include beautiful acrobatic displays of dance and motion. There will be a short video of some of Kinetic Light's work. This video includes captioning and ASL. Then we will hear from Alice, Laurel and Michael as they accept the award. Text reads, Descent by Kinetic Light. The dance takes place on a ramp, a sculpture that is 24 feet wide, 15 feet deep, and 6 feet high at its pointy peak. The ramp is a cross between an access ramp of straight planes and hard corners and a ski jump ramp with curves and banks and a point that rises hard into the air.
and they join arms and turn big circles with both chairs. And the sky behind them begins to lighten into washes of Revelation. stars and orange glowing. Revelation. Andromeda breaks away, rushes up to the left side Release. of the velodrome, and gets to the apex of the ramp platform and hurls herself onto it. Venus, close behind, lifts her chair up and onto the ramp with her seamlessly. They stay together holding hands and Venus breaks away and dances in her chair and circles and Andromeda dances her chair at the apex. Andromeda gets into her chair and wheels backwards down the ramp. She gets to the base of the ramp, spins counterclockwise and joins Venus who is rushed up to join her. They dance at the top of the velodrome. Lunge. Venus and, and Andromeda again. rest to the right together, pushing themselves backwards, turning and facing the left, backwards and then facing the right. Raptors riding the thermals. They dance from the top in a clockwise circle to the bottom of the velodrome. The moment. And they dance back up to the top of the velodrome. Now facing each other in their chair chairs. They hold hands. They drift away from each other, from the left and to the right, on the surface of the velodrome. Become The stage begins to darken. Slow. Curve. Moan of ramp. Flexing under hip. Venus rushes up to the top of the ramp. Shoulder. She rushes down. As Andromeda follows her back to the top of the ramp, turns and follows her back down the ramp, back onto the velodrome, and they turn circles on the velodrome to the base of the peak. Now at the top of the velodrome, holding hands, the chairs now at the upper left, now to the right. Now to the left, holding hands. And Rama and Venus chairs, connect. And knees touching. Seesawing back and forth. Your fingertips. Right. Your knuckles. To left. Your wrists. To right. Bend. And caress. Bend. To left. And caress. Gazing into each other's eyes. They rest their heads on each other's shoulders and embrace each other as the stage goes completely dark. Then. End of Act One. Hello, I'm Alice Shepherd, and it is a pleasure to join you all tonight by video. I'm a light-skinned, multiracial black woman. I'm wearing a light green scarf and a darker green sweater, and I have blonde, copper, and mustard green striped curly hair. I'm a wheelchair user, and I'm the artistic director of Kinetic Light. Kinetic Light, Michael, Laurel, and I thank you. It is an honor to be recognized by other disabled people for our work in disability arts. Founded in 2016 under my direction, Kinetic Light is a project-based ensemble of three disabled artists committed to intersectional disability art, aesthetics, and culture. Michael Mag is our lighting, video, and projection designer. Laura Lawson, dancer, choreographic collaborator, is also our tech and design lead. Working in the disciplines of art, technology, design and dance, Kinetic Light creates, performs and teaches at the nexus of access, disability, gender and race. We see disability as more than the deficit of diagnosis. Rooted in intersectional disability arts, politics and culture, Kinetic Light features work made by disabled artists. 
We show disabled artists and we imagine disabled audience members as our primary audience. We see access as an essential element of our artistry and not a retroactive accommodation. Those of you who listened to the video clip of our work, Descent, experienced some of our approach to audio description. Laura Lawson and Cycle Systems designed our app, Audimance, with reference to blind listening culture. Now you can listen to five works of art that convey the visuals of the dance and not just describe them. The thing about being a dance artist is that the body doesn't lie. The body does not lie. You can choose not to listen, but that truth is always there, and I find it refreshing. I always have a solid ground to return to. And in the world today, some stability, some truth is necessary. The truth of the body is a good place to begin when you are longing to speak truths of the world. So here, tonight, now is my truth. Disabled people are vital to contemporary life. We are vital to the future. And we will fight injustice wherever we see it by banding together to survive. And while we do that, we will make some incredible art because disabled people are necessary. Thank you for recognizing kinetic light. I miss you. I wish I were there with you in person until our paths cross again. Thank you. This is JD and I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker of the evening, Joe Shapiro. Joe is a longtime journalist with National Public Radio or NPR who has done numerous stories to shed a light on the civil rights and social justice abuse of people with disabilities. As we have mentioned at the beginning of the program, this year's gala also recognizes the 30th anniversary of the ADA. It can be a time to celebrate what has been done so far, but it can also be a time to look at the work we still need to do. Joe's stories have highlighted that, that work that is still needed, which has pushed the White House and Congress to pass new rules. His book, No Pity, looks at the history of people with disabilities and the way they have shaped civil rights movements. Here is Joe. Thank you again to everyone for participating with us this evening. We can celebrate, honor, and appreciate the things you've been doing in this pandemic. You've educated people, you've protected people. For the disability community, this feels like a singular moment. The community came together like this for passage of the ADA in 1990 to save the Affordable Care Act in 2017. Now it sounded the alarm about healthcare rationing to demand that people with disabilities not go to the back of the line for healthcare, to remind Americans that this is a country with hard won disability civil rights laws that those laws don't go away in a pandemic, that the lives of people with disabilities need to be valued. Disability groups across the country push the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services to investigate state rules that would allow doctors to deny life-saving care to some people with disabilities. And as I write this, the Civil Rights Office just announced the result of one investigation, an agreement with Alabama. Standards there allowed a doctor to deny a ventilator to some people with intellectual disabilities, to some people with traumatic brain injuries, to some people with moderate to severe dementia. So Alabama recently changed those rules. People with disabilities have a rational fear of the medical system based on past experience. I did the story for NPR. I called Lex Frieden. He's a research scientist and a professor he was staff director of the National Council on Disability when it wrote the first version of the ADA. He was a personal friend of President George H.W. Bush, the president who signed the ADA into law. At the end of his life, he got around using a wheelchair. So the ex-president and Lex would go to the movies together in their wheelchairs in Houston. None of this helped Lex in 2011 when a car ran a red light and hit his van. He was thrown from his wheelchair. 
at the emergency, the the doctor said his hip was broken. But the doctor said, since you don't walk, we're not going to operate on that broken hip. The doctor's decision that it made no sense to fix the shattered hip of a man who would never walk anyway turned out to be a mistake. It led to years of pain and trouble for Lex. He still needs to sit up in his wheelchair, but now he can't put his weight on the broken hip and he can't put all his weight all day on his good hip. So that means he can't sit up in his wheelchair for very long and that limits how much he can get around. Months after the accident, Lex went back to the hospital and explained why he got the wrong care. The director of the emergency room listened and changed the policy. People told me too about caring doctors who help them stay independent. Reva Lair, who we've honored tonight, told me about her own doctor. Reva said, any doctor we know we can trust is practically a secular saint in the community. I talked too to Alice Wong, the advocate who started the Disability Visibility Project. She said, people see me in this wheelchair. They see me with this mask over my face, the tube and the portable ventilator, and they underestimate my life. She turned 46 a few weeks ago. She told me, it's ironic. I am the most disabled I've ever been in my entire life, but I'm the most active I've ever been in doing the things I want to do with my life. But if she gets sick, she's afraid of how the medical system would see her. Would she get tested? Would she get treatment? The ADA unleashed a new generation of advocates, advocates who grew up with their rights protected. They expect those rights to be protected. They will use those rights. 30 years ago, the ADA became law, but without the high profile marches, protests, and clashes that marked other civil rights movements. I argued in my book, No Pity, there was a downside to this because Americans never really understood what the ADA was and who needed it. People thought it was for a small number of people over there in wheelchairs or for blind or deaf people. That's why on the 25th anniversary of the ADA, I did a story for NPR about how the law helps everyone. I went to New York City with a lawyer who'd filed lawsuits against the city. We went to a subway station where an elevator was installed only after a lawsuit. That morning, the elevator was in constant use by people with baby strollers, people pulling shopping carts, or just anyone who didn't want to walk up the steep, steep stairs. And I met a New York City police officer named Dan Carrion. He loved his job, but one day when a gun went off, he lost part of his hearing. The police department paid for his hearing aid, but then said, Someone with a hearing aid can't be a cop and forced him to take early retirement. He didn't think of himself as someone with a disability. I didn't want to use the word, he said. The hearing aid he wore in his ear was tiny and hidden. With it, he heard well, better than before his accident. It made no sense to him that he couldn't be a cop anymore. So he sued using the ADA and he won. He forced New York City to change its rules. Now people with minor disabilities, people who may not consider themselves disabled, can still serve as police or firefighters. He showed that the ADA protects those people who use wheelchairs, people who are deaf and blind, and that it protects all of us. There are lessons in this pandemic. For a civil rights law to have muscle, it has to be exercised. The ADA protects the value, the independence, even the lives of people with disabilities. And one day, any of us may need that protection. Join AUCD in celebrating ADA 30. This concludes the virtual program for the 2020 AUCD Gala, celebrating leadership in arts and culture. We'll have all the content from our program available on the AUCD for All website. Thank you again for celebrating with us, and we look forward to continuing to connect with all of you throughout the year. Good night. 
Thank you to our 2020 Gala committee members. Text, follow us hashtag AUCD for all, virtual gala, April 22nd. Gala logo inside computer screen, image of a globe with a burst of lines with words, Association of University Centers on Disabilities, surrounding globe. Text, AUCD for all, celebrating leadership in arts and culture.